One of the messages that I've been trying to communicate and um, colleagues through SIVA um, and the association is that there's a lot more to EEG interpretation than just these numbers that the processed EEG monitor produces. If we think about the monitors that we use every day in clinical practice, we see our SATS probes fall off, we see overdamped arterial lines, and we see artifacts on the ECG, and we always refer back to the trace to confirm or refute any mysterious reading. And EEG is no different. An expert opinion from NAP5, from SIVA and the ASA recommends that we become familiar with the EEG during anesthesia. It's a fascinating insight into mechanisms of actions of the drugs that we use, a fantastic learning tool and an emerging insight into our patient's brain health and post-operative course, as well as potentially reducing the risk of uh, accidental awareness under neuromuscular blockade. So um, a few declarations, as there always is with these sorts of things. Um, I've been paid for work by Medtronic, who make BIS monitors. I've been not paid by Narcotrend for educational stuff. I sit on the SIVA Council and I'm a bit of a geek. This graph on the right shows how um, we've increased our use of processed EEG in Nottingham over the last uh, um, decade or so, which is absolutely fantastic. We're now the biggest users of processed EEG in the country, which is really something to be uh, uh, proud of, I think. And you can see how the increased use of uh, processed EEG has um, mirrored our use of TIVA lines, which I use as the metric for uh, how many TIVA cases we do, which I know isn't accurate, but it's nice to see it's almost one to one. And you can see the little green bulge at the bottom, which is uh, our, our use of the Narcotrend since October. If we think right back here, this was me and Miles using uh, a couple of BIS monitors, uh, and now we're up to 87 BIS monitors um, and uh, six Narcotrends. So this is absolutely super. So well done everybody for uh, embracing the future. Um, I'm going to talk you through EEG orientation, basic science. I want to show you the EEG during induction, maintenance, emergence, and during a few arousal phenomena, um, and also give you some troubleshooting tips. I was going to whiz through the BIS software update, which MESU are going to roll out maybe this week even. Okay, so if we look at um, the pyramidal cells in the brain, these are the cells that are sitting right bang up against the cortex, and beautifully they're aligned next to each other um, with these uh, synapses right up against the, uh, the, the cortex. And there's six layers of these, and they're producing these wonderful electronic uh, signals and these oscillations of brain waves. And what we see is that these different neurons are producing different frequencies of oscillation. So what we see through our EEG uh, lead is a summation of around 50 to half, 50,000 to half a million um, uh, neurons per EEG channel. And they're all summated together uh, to form this one waveform called a local field potential. Just to take you through a little bit of language around EEG monitoring, we need to think about the frequency, which is the number of cycles per second. Higher the number, the higher the frequency. And the amplitude, which is the height of the waves, from low amplitude through to very high amplitude oscillation. And I use the word oscillations rather than uh, uh, waves per se, because that's what anesthesia is. Anesthesia is a state of induced abnormal oscillation in the brain that we control. And if we look at how uh, uh, some different frequencies here, we can see these uh, very high frequency gamma oscillations, which the EEG doesn't measure very well, these beta oscillations through to these very slow delta and slow waves. And these are the things we're really, really interested in during anesthesia. At any one time, our brain's producing all of these uh, different frequencies, but we change the amount of these frequencies using our anesthetic agents. So we move from a state of high frequency to low frequency, and we're particularly interested in the slow delta and the alpha oscillations. So a little bit about waveforms. When we're awake, you can see this very, very low amplitude, high frequency, chaotic, unpredictable, wobbly scribble of a line. As we become increasingly anaesthetized, you can see that the lines get a higher amplitude and slower and more predictable. They have less entropy uh, for want of a, a better term. So, and as we start to deliver more and more anesthesia and start to switch mitochondria off and produce less ATP, we'll start to see less neuronal firing and we enter into a state of uh, burst suppression 
and then finally an isoelectric EEG. And this is a comparative anaesthetic overdose. We don't need the brain to be in this steep state to achieve anaesthesia. I want to show you a little bit of video. This is always dangerous to do on any form of PowerPoint, let alone one over Teams. So let's see how this works. Um, this is uh, an 18 year old having a uh, lap appendix, so nothing particularly exciting, a modified RSI using a TIVA TCI technique. To put it into context, she's gonna receive around about 160 milligrams of propofol um, as part of the, the, the bolus using Marsh's model. And uh, she's got a Remy fentanyl infusion running at four nanograms a mil and will be paralyzed with 60 milligrams of rocuronium. What I want you to do is to have a look at how the EEG changes and how quickly it changes before I break this down for you to have a look at over the next few slides. So let's just drop down that awake EEG at the bottom by means of comparison. So just inducing. OK, so I think having seen that induction of anaesthesia in a young patient with uh, who's producing some lovely high amplitude brain waves, we can look at that now and say that's very different to the awake brain. And really, I could end the talk there. That's what uh, I want people to go away with, uh, appreciating that the anaesthetized EEG is very different to the awake EEG. Let's break this down a little bit more you know, over the next few slides. So. Um, before I start to describe the EEG and go through the changes, I think we should be putting our EEG monitors on prior to the induction of anaesthesia. I do really think this is important. The incidence of awareness around induction, regardless of the technique you use, is high. According to NAP5, we need to think about drug errors, i.e. inadvertently administering a neuromuscular blocking agent um, rather than a, a hypnotic, the accidental uh, antibiotic, rather than sodium thiopental, of which more later. Um, we need to think about the mind the gap phenomena as we transition from an intravenous agent onto a volatile. We need to think about the time where um, uh, maintenance is not delivered during a difficult intubation, and then the technical failures of vaporizers, syringes, and cannulae. Dementia and delirium will also lower any index value that your processed EEG monitor is, is producing because they produce those conditions produce more slow wave activity. So the brain looks a bit more sleepy. Some patients, about five to 10% of patients will have a genetically low amplitude EEG, which the monitors actually can struggle in some cases to pick up and can produce an artificially low value. So a baseline, as in most things we do, is very important. Intubation is a maximal stimulus. It's, it's in fact a, a, a greater stimulus than surgical incision and it's a time of huge cortical arousal, as I'll show you later on. Uh, so I really think we want to have the brain monitored prior to the induction of anesthesia. And the patients uh, seem to tolerate it well, and they all seem to say, oh, you won't find anything in there, doc, which I'm sure the uh, radiologists and radiographers get to with every CT brain they ever perform. But anyway, so the awake brain, if we look at this, is uh, producing very small amplitude, high frequency oscillations and look very fuzzy. These are beta oscillations. Superimposed on this, we'll see eye movements and blinking, which sometimes shoot off the top of the screen, such as their enormous power. And then sometimes we'll see high amplitude, high frequency EMG. And EMG is really important as we'll come on to later on. So here we go. I've administered my 160 milligram propofol bolus from the pump at this point. Second one, two, three, four we're seeing a movement. This is probably the patient uh, blinking as the propofol hits the brain and they get that moment, oh, crikey, I wonder what that is. Um, so we can see, already see something happening that quickly. We're gonna skip forward a little bit. Here we see the EEG starting, the oscillations starting to increase in amplitude and reduce in frequency. Can you see they're getting taller there? This is something called beta activation. You see this uh, occurring during a gradual slow uh, TIVA TCI induction. This is the cortex of the brain starting to get paradoxically excited. If you think when you do an inhalational induction with sevoflurane, for instance, patients can go through, patients go through a period of arousal. We're all told, don't instrument the airway. 
uh, at this point. And this is what we see in the brain. These um, oscillations, these beta oscillations increase in, in size, even though the patient is starting to become anaesthetized. And we can see these uh, purposeless or defensive movements, incoherent speech, euphoria or dysphoria. I think with TV, you tend to see perhaps a little bit of euphoria rather than any of those other, other signs. The amplitude's higher, the EMG starts to fall, and we see a loss of those eye movements and blinks. I'm just traced on here some of those low frequency oscillations. I think if you uh, use the eye of faith, you can start to see these undulations appearing from what started off as a very flat looking baseline. As we start to move through the next few seconds during uh, uh, the peripheral bolus, we see some absolutely massive slow waves. Now we know they're slow waves because this is just one second. And if you count them, we've got one, two, one, two. So that's a, a, a very low frequency, just two hertz oscillation there, which is gonna be associated with loss of consciousness. When you see this, your patient is unconscious. There's absolutely no, no two ways about this. We've hit the brainstem hard there with a big bolus of propofol and essentially switched it off. And this is due to inhibition of, of the thalamic reticular neurons around the thalamus, the thalamus itself, and some of the cortical neurons. And we'll just talk about that mechanism in a moment. And here come those wobbly lines again. And we can see those low frequencies um, oscillating under the, uh, with, with these sort of higher frequency waves over the top there. And if I bring in that awake EEG, just to compare it, these oscillations here are five to 20 times larger than the awake EEG. These are the, some of the largest biopotentials that you ever see uh, during uh, an electroencephalogram outside of seizures. Absolutely huge, really satisfying to see. You absolutely know your drugs have hit the right spot when that occurs. Then during the rest of the, uh, the anesthetic, those very large uh, slow waves will give way to uh, delta oscillations, um, which is slightly faster, slightly smaller, with these overriding alpha oscillations here. And it can take several minutes for this pattern to form if you've given a very large dose of propofol and you've burst suppressed your patient. There we are, we can see again, I've drawn on those slow waves, those undulations, which over the top, these little spikes ride. And then we're settling down into a little bit more of an organized pattern with these little sharp alpha 10 hertz oscillations sitting on top of those, um, those slow waves and, and delta oscillations. So what is going on? Well, one of the really nice things about anesthesia is how it changes the spatial distribution of the EEG. If you close your eyes and relax, and we put EEG dots all over your head, you find that you've got some really large alpha oscillations, 10 hertz oscillations right at the back in your, in your occiput. And that's almost like the, the meditation rhythm, if you like. Following loss of consciousness, these strong alpha oscillations move into the frontal lobes, right where we put our EEG stickers. And this happens around the time of loss of consciousness. So if we're seeing very large alpha oscillations, our patients are either meditating or they're anaesthetized. And this is one of the beauties of having the uh, uh, frontal EEG visible all of the time. Just thinking about some of the neuroscience of what we're actually doing, the thalamus, which is this red bit here, pink bit here, is the gateway to all sensory modalities to reach the cortex and then be consciously perceived, apart from the sense of smell. That's kind of weird, because if you remember old films, when people were unconscious, somebody gave them smelling salts and they woke up and there probably is some science behind that, that the thalamus um, is every sensory modality aside from smell. So smell gets into uh, the cortex without going through the thalamus. We knock the thalamus out with our anesthetic. So first thing that happens is we blast the arousal centers in the brainstem, bosh. Then we're gonna slow down the thalamic firing rate. Normally the thalamus oscillates at 30 to 50 Hertz, the gamma band, but with propofol, we slow this down and the, and the uh, halogenated ethers as well. We slow it down to around about 10 hertz. And that 10 hertz thing is really important. If you remember nothing else, remember 10 hertz. Um, this is breaking up conduction of signals from the thalamus to the frontal cortex. And with this slowing down, it's like putting the brakes on the traffic. Not as much information is going to get to the frontal cortex to produce consciousness. 
the brain wants fast signals. It's only getting slow signals. We can see that oscillation in the EEG. The other thing that's happening is we should be able to normally, bits of the cortex are talking to other bits of the cortex in our brain. We have long range communications between one bit of cortex and another, but we break that down as well with the propofol. So we're breaking down the thalamocortical pathways as well as the intercortical communications. And we can see all of this in the EEG. Just to put that into a, a nice little animation, Here's our nice awake brain, which is shuttling information from the thalamus to the cortex really, really quickly, around about 30 to 50 hertz. And here's our much slower anaesthetized brain that's just oscillating at around about 10 hertz. And those frontal um, EEG oscillations are created by propofol's effect on the thalamus and the cortex. And this state of anesthesia is readily identifiable on the EEG here. So, let me just show you this animation. Um, I do think EEG is a, a, a very mobile signal because it's non-repeating. It's best to look at it as a video. I hope this works. So we can see here a nice reproducing signal um, where we've got an up and down undulation. Those are those slow waves coming from the cortex and from the brainstem to an extent, and this sawtooth baseline. If we look at it on this side, I've taken a photo and drawn on those oscillations again. And we can see just two peaks. One, two. Now, the geek in me knows it takes 4.4 seconds for the uh, EEG to sweep from one side to the other. If we divide 4.4, uh, two by 4.4, we get to 0.5 of a hertz. So this is a slow wave. And all of these little peaks on the top here, these are all our alpha oscillations. And again, if you're a geek, I took a photo, counted them, that's 46, divide that by 4.4, that's 10.5 hertz. So this is exactly the sort of picture you want to see in a patient who's adequately anaesthetized. Um, the numbers aren't all, aren't all the, we don't always need to see the numbers to be able to discern this. So here's two pictures, both of which represent perfect anesthesia. This is a nice young brain that's generating these very, very large uh, alpha oscillations. Um, whereas this is an older brain. You can see the amplitude of these alpha oscillations is much smaller. And if you want to hear a bit more than about that, then um, my uh, uh, talk from a, a few weeks ago about birth suppression and the vulnerable brain dives a little bit deeper into the uh, aging brain and how, uh, how that influences the EEG. So again, I've highlighted the alpha oscillations. I confess I got a little bit bored here, so I haven't highlighted them all, but I've highlighted some at the crest of this particular peak. And I've illustrated these uh, delta waves here, which we've got one, two, three, four, that's one hertz. And the same here, one, two, three, four. So we've got this nice undulating baseline with these superimposed alpha oscillations on top. And that's what anesthesia looks like when we're looking at the frontal EEG. What I have done in both of these cases is to turn the filters on the BIS monitor off. The BIS unusually has a, a filter on by default, which works at two hertz. Um, I'm not quite sure why it works at two hertz, but that does mean that the EEG tends to look really, really flat because it's filtering out these um, slow waves and delta waves, making them look quite flat. It doesn't take them out of the number, but it does take them out of the EEG that you look at. So do try experimenting with turning the filters off and uh, see how, uh, how you get on. If you do see electrical interference, then the filters would need to stay on uh, just to make, just so you could see a, a, a nice pattern without too much interference. But if you can turn the filters off, which you can most of the time, then you're able to see those undulations as well and start to feel confident with looking at the EEG um, in conjunction with, and then perhaps instead of the number. Just to put some evidence behind all of this, and it's not just uh, some rubbish that I've come up with myself, um, lovely. Uh, there's been many, many studies. Uh, Emery Brown is the, is the key name and the sort of foremost international expert with his big team, at, uh, uh, Massachusetts General. And what they did is they did ultra slow inductions of anesthesia. And the surgeons might think we're slow, but these guys were taking between about uh, 40 minutes and an hour to induce anesthesia with tiny, tiny increments of propofol um, while, while performing high resolution um, uh, EEG, which is 1,024 leads in some cases, as well as simultaneous functional MRI scanning. 
And there's a few really interesting points in what's otherwise quite a complicated looking picture. The first point is on this little bit at the top, the blue and the red lines. They were being played simultaneously, uh, some stimulation. And that was either a click or their name being said uh, through the headphones. And their responses to these sounds were um, assessed. And what, what they found, and one of the things they found rather, it's a small print thing, but we see it every day, is that patients lose um, response to a mechanical sound before they lose response to their name or an, in, or an emotionally significant bit of sound. And the same towards emergence as well, uh, which is at this end, return of con uh, consciousness. They regain um, response to their name before they regain response to a mechanical uh, sound. So, you know, a wonderful example is at the end of the operation, you say, open your eyes, the patient opens their eyes, but just moments, seconds before the uh, scrub nurse has dropped the tray of instruments and the patient hasn't stirred, and that was far louder. So we see this every single day. It's why uh, asking the patients to open their eyes will elicit more of a response than dropping something. As we move down, we can look here at um, these are the alpha oscillations being measured at the back of the head here, nose is at the front, and we can see with loss of consciousness, those alpha oscillations have moved from, from the, the, the back of the head to the front where we're measuring them, and then with the uh, recovery of consciousness, the, uh, they, they've moved back to the, the back of the head. That's this wonderful anteriorization that we see. This bit of the graph is showing us that those low frequency oscillations, those slow waves and delta waves become very, very much higher power uh, with loss of, loss of reconsciousness and then drift away with recovery of consciousness towards the end. And then this is looking at those alpha oscillations that we just mentioned. With um, during uh, periods of uh, unconsciousness, the alpha oscillations are largest at the top of the wave. And then as we get a little bit light, they're largest towards the bottom of those delta waves. A little bit like um, here, we can see they're very large at the top of that oscillation, but quite small towards the bottom. In this case, they're just big everywhere, really. Um, but both of those would be uh, would be very satisfactory. This is a bit difficult to pick up in every case, but very satisfying when you do see it. Other things that you see in the anaesthetized patient, this is, uh, the, this is the, the printed output of uh, um, the, the BIS monitor, um, looking at a few seconds here. And what we've got is two channels, obviously just on one side of the brain. And if we look at these alpha oscillations, and you can pick up the deltas, slow undulations, and then these faster alpha oscillations, around about 10 to 12 hertz. If we look at them in, these are two different places. So this is spatially different on the forehead, a few centimeters apart. They all line up and this is called coherence. This indicates that the thalamus deeper down in the brain is sending these oscillations forward to the frontal cortex and they're all beautifully aligned. If we were conscious, coherence doesn't really occur. Different bits of the brain are firing left, right and center doing all sorts of crazy stuff. So. This does support the thalamus as being that site of rhythm generation. And we don't, again, if I see this, this is incredibly reassuring. Um, and we can all just uh, turn our BIS monitors onto two channels and have a look at that if we wanted to. And we can even look at both sides of the brain separately. And this is looking at the uh, front and, uh, the, sorry, the left and the right um, uh, temple. And um, we can see here with this little bit of video that how well lined up those alpha oscillations are between both sides of the brain, again, indicating that the thalamus deep down in the brain is the rhythm generator for anesthesia. So obviously I've shown you a few slides of what adequate anesthesia looks like on the EEG and gives you an indication of what these uh, machines are measuring to an extent. Um, if we go a little bit deep, we start to see birth suppression. And birth suppression is a pathological state and indicates a, an anaesthetic overdose or one of other several significant events uh, occurring intraoperatively, or even a, a, what we call a vulnerable brain. And I point you to the YouTube presentation about that to get your head around that concept of how some patients can have their, the, the anaesthetic effect uh, can be quite pronounced and really start to switch um, their um, mitochondria off and reduce ATP production. So what we've got here is isoelectricity, oops, I apologize, isoelectricity, and then the thalamus trying to kickstart the cortex into life with this great big uh, electrical potential here um, called a burst. You'll see burst suppression 
um, counted on the BIS monitor in the top right hand corner of the screen with the term SR, suppression ratio, which is the percentage of every 63 seconds of time that the BIS is isoelectric. And we want that number to be zero. Um, a high number there indicates that we're really starting to switch parts of the brain off. It doesn't add anything to the anaesthetic at all. And in fact, burst suppression doesn't even stop patients from moving. Um, profoundly burst suppressed people can still produce EMG and even, um, even movement, um, particularly with uh, uh, propofol, because uh, propofol is so very good at switching the brain to uh, uh, the anaesthetized state and uh, burst suppressing it. So there's no real indication for birth suppression outside of specific circumstances in uh, neuro, intensive care, and perhaps during uh, deep hypothermic arrest, um, where patients are actively cooled and do become birth suppressed. Um, so weirdly, the BIS algorithm doesn't reduce the BIS index value until the suppression ratio is above 40%. And I'll show you an example of that soon. That's why it's important to keep an eye on the suppression ratio and the raw EEG, because the BIS number doesn't tell the whole story. I'm going to show you some funny things now. So signs of arousal, patients starting to get light, for instance, uh, discordance when the machines and the EEG uh, don't seem to agree, and a little bit about EMG and some background interference. So here's another appendix. So during um, phase one of um, uh, COVID, we were all encouraged to move away from uh, TIVA to, to protect, protect the NHS, protect propofol supplies. So I started using uh, something called thiopental and sevaflurane, um, which uh, alien drugs in my hands, but um, I had to go with them anyway. So this is a 28 year old uh, gentleman who's going to be induced with six point, well, just over six, 6 6.1 milligrams per kilogram of sodium thiopental, so around about 500 milligrams. He's had um, one and a half um, milligrams of alfentanil prior to that, and then he's gonna be paralyzed with uh, succimethonium and then transition onto sevaflurane following intubation. And it was a straightforward intubation. What I want to show you is um, what happens during intubation when sodium thiopental is used. So I'll try and narrate over the uh, video, which I hope you can see. So in, uh, inducing anesthesia now, starting to see these higher frequency oscillations. In a moment, we're gonna see some enormous, there we go, um, uh, slow waves, lots of slow waves and delta waves, hit the brainstem hard, the machines indicating appropriate anesthesia, intubation occurring now, watch how we lose those slow waves and delta waves and the EEG becomes flatter. This is the sign of a brain that's starting to wake up. Narcotrain's recording that. See, we've lost, we've still got those alpha oscillations, but we've lost those slow and delta waves following the stimulus of laryngoscopy and intubation. And now the delta waves are starting to come back. And we're back into a much happier place. And that's a very, very typical anesthetic regime. And I would say, more generous than seen in NAP5 that indicated um, an, an average dose of thio of about four milligrams per kilogram, I used six and found that cortical arousal, even following a straightforward intubation. So what we saw there was the brain starting to wake up, cortical arousal. We saw a movement towards those flat, that flatter EEG. Uh, we lost those delta oscillations. Um, and I think it's really important that we're vigilant during times of stimulus change. That could be surgical or anaesthetic stimulus change uh, for these EEG changes, because certain monitors will lag behind, uh, their index values lag quite behind the EEG. Certainly abyss will lag 45 to 60 seconds behind the EEG change. And I think it's actually quite easy to spot that. Um, I'll just play that again for interest's sake. Um, and again, point out the point of induction, induction now. There's those massive slow waves, settling into some slow and delta oscillations. Sucks has gone in at this point, of course. Intubation now, starting to flatten off. Very flat now, we've lost all those delta and slow waves. 
machine registers that as looking a bit light. And then as the stimulus passes, we'll see those delta and slow waves reform. There are ways around that, considering an extra dose of sodium thiopental or propofol. It's not seen when we use TIVA, of course, because we're not seeing um, the very short KEO effect of thio wearing off and that gap effect with the volatiles reaching MAC. So it was a it's a lovely illustration and I've seen it many times. It's been well published in the literature about the excitatory effects of laryngoscopy following uh, um, uh, sodium thiopental induction. And it's one of these things, unless you use a processed EEG monitor, you just never see it. So I, I learned quite a lot from doing that. Another form of arousal is delta arousal. And this is actually, it's paradoxical really. So here we've got a nice trace. This is um, the uh, entropy system. So we've got an EEG that shows us up and down slow oscillations with these alpha spindles on top. The patient's been intubated. Then immediately afterwards, we're just seeing delta, great big um, waves with a few of these alpha oscillations. And this is paradoxical cortical arousal. The brain looks more anaesthetized after the stimulus. That's the wrong way around, that shouldn't happen. And the processed EEG value can fall. So the, the mechanism of this isn't known. There are some old papers that, that suggest this happened in about 30% of patients following a surgical stimulus. Um, I've not seen it myself and I do look for these sorts of things, um, but it's just a nice interesting thing to observe occurring. And again, without processed EEG, we'd have no idea that this was happening when the patient was starting to, to get light. Another form of arousal is something called transient alpha loss. So this is a density spectral array of which um, I've, there's another little YouTube video uh, where I talk about this uh, if you're so interested and you'll see this coming on the new BIS monitor software upgrade and on the Narcotrend, of course. And this is a beautiful way to look at anesthesia and to dissect these oscillations down and make, makes it much, much easier to recognise what's going on. So this is that 18 year old girl having her lap appendix again, where we've induced anesthesia. We've got these beautiful delta oscillations at the bottom here and then these alpha oscillations going along here. We've got knife to skin, and then we've created a pneumoperitoneum at around this point here. And we see these alpha oscillations disappear. And this is really strange. So this is something that you see with patients who are having abdominal surgery and is hypothesized as being vaguely mediated from peritoneal stretch. Um, and the weird route that the vagus nerve, the wanderer, takes back up to the brain and somehow manages to avoid some of the um, uh, inhibitory effects of our, our opiates. But I've only ever seen this once, but it's a really as it's the third form of, uh, of, of arousal that one may see. The message, though, is to be vigilant in your EEG around changes in stimulus, both surgical and anaesthetic. Just going to show you some discordance now where things don't quite agree and the reason for looking at the processed EEG. So here on the left, we've got, a, I think we'd all agree, a very, very flat looking EEG and a suppression ratio showing a significant amount of birth suppression, 21% birth suppression. So uh, I would say that that's, that's pretty significant. That's around about uh, 12, 13 seconds of suppression in every 63 uh, second epoch. But look at the BIS number. If we just relied on the index number, we'd be like, oh, that's all right. I'm quite happy with this. But that is a very, very anaesthetized looking brain um, with that sort of suppression ratio. The index number is higher than expected. And this is because of the slightly unusual way that the BIS deals with birth suppression. So back historically, back in the day, those big high amplitude bursts that we saw in that slide uh, that I used to illustrate birth suppression confused the monitor and made the monitor think that there was uh, a more active awake brain. So what they did in the algorithm was made it so that a suppression ratio of less than 40% doesn't affect the birth suppression, uh, sorry, it doesn't affect the BIS index value particularly. So between BIS values of 30 and 40, which is covered by a slightly different algorithm, we can see brain states with suppression ratios between zero and 40%. So BIS numbers between 30 and 40 are a bit of a gray area and do recommend us looking at the suppression ratio and the EEG itself. And I think that picture in itself encapsulates the importance of looking at the EEG and the suppression ratio 
and using both of those things to decide whether the BIS is producing an index value which is of use or isn't of use. And in this case, it isn't. If we look at the other one next door, we've got the opposite problem. We've got a BIS number of 29 that might make us think, oh, crikey, that's a little bit too anaesthetized. I'm going to back off. But look at the EEG. We can see that wonderful up and down uh, slow wave and we can see lots of oscillations consistent with our alpha frequencies. This is exactly what we want to see during anesthesia, absolutely perfect. Yet the BIS is suggesting that the patient is a bit too deep. Note the suppression ratio, which we can use to cross correlate these things is zero. This is perfect, absolutely happy. But what's happening here is it's transitioning because of a particular value that we can't see that it's measuring called spectral edge frequency. This has drifted a little bit lower than the, 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 the programmers wanted. So it's moved to a different algorithm that can only produce lower numbers. Even though I'd look at this and say, gosh, surely that should be around 42, which weirdly is the median value that Abyss Monitor produces and just happens to be the answer to life, the universe and everything. EMG is interesting. And I think that's why I posed that question about the Rocky Ronium um, to uh, Dave following his fantastic uh, presentation there, a really, really interesting case. EMG causes quite a few problems with any processed EEG monitor. EMG is the electromyogram, it's a measurement of muscle activity. What the BIS does is use EMG to indicate whether or not people are awake or whether they are asleep. And if you cast your minds back to uh, Peter Schuller's fantastic experiments, um, Peter's an anaesthetist in Cairns who, um, with nine of his colleagues, they paralysed each other first with succinothonium, then with rocuronium, with an isolated forearm so they could communicate. And they were completely awake, completely awake, able to answer maths questions through their unparalysed arm with a BIS monitor on. And whilst the rest of their body and their face, facial muscles were, of course, deeply paralysed with sucks or, or uh, rocuronium, the BIS monitor fell to indicate values consistent with anaesthesia. And this is because the BIS monitor is looking for paralysis and the lack of movement as an indicator that our patients are falling asleep. I'll show you one slide on that in a moment. But let's just look at the uh, monitor on the, on the left here. We can see here, this is the BIS trend. This has been taken after the case has finished, um, which is why this looks a little bit awake. But um, I'm reviewing the trend here and I can see here it started to trend up. I'm looking at the EMG and I can see there's oh, quite a little bit of EMG here as well. A neuromuscular blocking agent has been administered and the BIS value has fallen back to uh, life, the universe and everything. The meaning of life, uh, 42. Um, and we'll talk about how to make that decision perhaps a little bit later on. So this is the effect of perhaps too much EMG, pushing the BIS up, we take the EMG away and the BIS produces a lower number. It's flicked back to a different algorithm. We've got another problem here as well. This is a very nice looking EEG here, really very nice. We've got those slow undulations. We've got those alpha oscillations riding on the top there exactly as we want to see, but we've got a BIS number of 71. Well, that makes us think that, uh, gosh, crikey, the patient's awake deepen everything, deepen everything. We'll just achieve burst suppression if we do that. But look, this is because the EMG is a little bit high. This is probably uh, one of my uh, patients in, in ENT where there's a bit of facial diathermy going on, had a parotid or some facial nerve diathermy, where there's a bit of uh, uh, the parotid um, being diathermied and we're getting a little bit of uh, very, very small voltage uh, EMG being produced. So the BIS has recognized that EMG, thinks, oh, EMG equals somebody who's awake, or move to an algorithm that looks for, um, that produces higher values, that looks for a more awake EEG, and it's producing 71, which just happens to be a transition point between two different sorts of algorithm. Uh, so this would be, uh, the EEG here is incredibly reassuring. So I think in this case, I wouldn't write down the number, I would write down a narrative, maybe put an asterisk in the BIS box at that point and say, uh, a convincing uh, alpha delta pattern on the EEG. This does not look like that awake brain we saw earlier at all. So I think we can be reliably convinced that this is certainly an anaesthetized patient. This is a lovely picture that Paul Martin gave me a week or so ago. This is an unparalyzed patient having um, uh, um, ophthalmic surgery, whereas you can imagine that the um, ophthalmic surgeon is fiddling around near the, near the head end, um, as they do. Um, 
producing EMG signal uh, through the EEG uh, dots, perhaps even by local contact or just by uh, um, the, the mode of their, their work. And we can see that the BIS trend is rising simultaneously with the um, increase in EMG as it transitions from one algorithm to another. It's being artificially elevated there, all other things being equal. So it's very important, again, to familiarize yourself with the, with the EMG um, the signal and with how the BIS works. So the reason that, it, that the uh, BIS guys used EMG in the first place is something we see every day. So when we administer our propofol, propofol rushes um, up your, into your brain, up your brain stem, hits some of the um, um, motor sensors in the, um, in the spinal cord, uh, takes out some of the um, um, motor, sensor, motor centers uh, in the brain as well, and we see the EMG start to fall. And we produce less and less EMG as we become increasingly anaesthetized. And that's what the that's why the algorithm transitions. Going back though, makes it look like the brain's awake and the BIS will start to produce higher numbers, um, which is all a bit strange. Um, so odd values and interference. EEG is essentially, uh, these EEG monitors are very well filtered. They're working in this awful electrically hostile environment for these very, very delicate electrical signals. Remember that EEG is in the microvolt range. ECG is millivolts, and yet we're throwing uh, diathermy and all sorts of other signals uh, into the vicinity of the patient's brain, um, which can cause interference, however well filtered and uh, shielded our devices are. There were lots of problems with the early BIS devices, which were upset by things like warmers, pacing, Henry wrote a letter uh, in 2007 about bypass um, producing oscillations in the ECG, which were picked up uh, in, in the brain. But that was a, an older version of the BIS, the BIS XP with a, an older version of the algorithm. Uh, so I think a lot of these problems have got a lot better. Um, of course, many of those sorts of signals are rhythmic. Um, and so you should be able to pick them up on the ECG, uh, sorry, on the EEG, because of course the EEG isn't rhythmic. Uh, it's a non-repeating algorithm. It always looks a little bit different. There's not a lot, of, not a, a huge pattern to the individual waves, although we can make out frequencies. So when you think about frequent uh, interference, think about things going on around the head, noise, pacemakers, etc. Much more unusual these days. Diathermy, of course, produces uh, lots of uh, interference, as we'll all see. Things around the brain, so EMG frontalis masseter and uh, the extraocular muscles. If you're seeing a lot of EMG, I think I would advise ensuring that you're confident that your anesthetics being appropriately delivered, um, cannulas patent, etc., cetera, uh, volatile, uh, uh, appropriate. Um, assess the patient clinically. Eyes are a good sign. Um, that eye signs aren't always uh, um, a good differentiator under anesthesia. Some patients do get uh, pupillary dilatation, I'm told. Um, there's a wonderful paper on this um, neurological examination for the anesthesiologist in, in A&A by Emery Brown and an ophthalmic surgeon, actually. Um, really good paper. Um, but and look for uh, clean epochs. That means bits of EEG trace which aren't affected by all of this uh, artifact. Um, and see if you've got any of the features that I've described, those slow waves and those overriding alpha up alpha oscillations. And then there's a whole range of things that can go on inside the brain. And those I've starred are the things that we can pick up preoperatively. Um, so if you are starting to see anything unusual, particularly birth suppression that's uh, come on uh, during an operation, uh, think of all of those different causes, including hypoglycemia. You do need a blood sugar of less than uh, around about 1, 1 1.5 millimoles to uh, start to see birth suppression in the EEG. Uh, and some of those other interesting signs there, as well as some intracranial problems that our, our surgeons can cause. Um, so a whole range of different things, but we're always worth assessing the patient clinically. So just um, as we start to round up some troubleshooting, how to troubleshoot these oddities. So one thing I do is a propofol ping. So it's a term I've got from a guy called Jamie Slay in uh, New Zealand, who's an authority on all things uh, brain related. If we think about, use that horrible term, depth of anesthesia, and think about how a, how a boat or a submarine measures depth, well, it does it with sonar that sends out pings. If we want to work out how deep the patient is, if we administer a small but safe dose of propofol, three to four mils in an adult patient, we can then observe the EEG. So if you see something strange, the default position would be to, well, make that patient a little bit deeper, 
with a small bolus and observe the EEG. Do you start to see an increase in those slow waves or even a drift to birth suppression if things were okay as it were? Um, and then correlate uh, those findings with clinical examination of the patient where possible, uh, particularly the eyes and signs of uh, sympathetic stimulus, which whilst not um, uh, desperately specific or indeed sensitive, uh, uh, do have a value, I think. Then check your cannula, check that you're delivering a rational drug dose, um, and then look for any change in surgical stimulus, because often it can be our surgical chums um, moving to operate outside an area of regional blockade, for instance, or changing their stimulus, uh, which can cause a change in these values. And then think about perfusion, oxygenation, whether or not there's any seizures going on, which are rare, but occasionally you can see with sevoflurane. And then think about those artifacts in, on and around the brain. And then finally, some just take home points. I think I hope I've demonstrated that the raw EEG undergoes some readily observable changes under anesthesia and that we as anaesthetists are good at recognising patterns. It's pretty much what we do, isn't it? Pattern recognition. The numbers that we uh, uh, use don't give us the whole picture. And I think I've demonstrated that. And for those of you interested in getting started with that, um, make the EEG the dominant picture on the BIS monitor and look at those changes at the time of induction. Look for those big slow waves. Um, and then hopefully that will convince you that uh, what I've said over the last half hour isn't, isn't complete nonsense. And then look out for that alpha delta pattern during maintenance, which is best seen in young brains. And moving on from there, have a look at the uh, density spectral array on the uh, updated BIS monitors and the Narcotrend monitors, because this is undoubtedly the future and takes us away from having to look at index values at all and is reliably correlated with the, uh, a lack of recall and um, unconsciousness. Um, so I, I'll end things there. Thank you.